Okay, well, my job here is to welcome you all to this webinar about finance. This webinar is designed for conservation professionals to learn more about farm finance generally. We're hosting a second set of webinars kind of on the flip side for farm finance, farm educators, farm business educators to learn more about conservation. And those are July 24 and 26. So if you find yourself in the wrong webinar, this is the time to move or to attend the other one if you're more interested in that. Also, if any of you work with um, farm finance people who you wish had more background in conservation, that might be a good event to invite those people to. These webinars are part of a SARE grant that is being run by uh, the UW-Madison Division of Extension, represented by Jenny Seifert here today, and the University of Minnesota, uh, Marcel Lewandowski and myself, Anna Cates from the Minnesota Office for Soil Health, have been working on the Minnesota side. So our goals today are to give everybody a little better sense of how farm finance works. Um, this is what our agenda looks like. We're going to do these first two modules today and then the second two modules on our second webinar on Thursday. Uh, because there's so many people in the webinar, we ask that you stay muted and mostly use the chat. Although um, if you have a question and we don't understand what you've typed, we might ask you to unmute yourself and speak up. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is actually a little chance to talk to each other. We're going to do a speed networking round where you'll go into a small breakout room with three or so other people and have a chance to just say hello, give your background, are you, um, uh, what's your position in terms of a conservation educator, and get to know a couple of other people in the webinar because we have quite a few people here today. Are we ready to do that, Jenny? No, we're not quite ready to do that. <laughs> we could do the Three, general polls seconds. first. Yeah, go ahead. Anna, do you want to do the polls first? Yeah, we could do the big picture polls first. Here we go. So what is your professional affiliation? This will be like the um, online version of a speed networking thing, everybody networking. Can other people see the results of the poll or do you have to share that, Jenny? Um, I can share it out when, when people are done. Okay. Looks like most people ended up in the right webinar just in terms of professional affiliation. I'm not seeing anybody say that they're um, working for a bank necessarily. It looks like most everyone's uh, completed it. There we go. So we have mostly local government units, some state and federal government and research professionals. That's great. And let's go to our next poll if I can. This has to do with your background coming into this on finance and conservation topics. Okay, it looks like once again, we've got about the right audience. This is, you're in the right place if you're pretty confident in your ability to do conservation and you'd like to know a little bit more about farm finance. Okay, now can we do our speed networking round, Jenny? Yep, yeah, we're well, as ready as ever. All right, so same kind of questions to discuss amongst yourselves for just a few minutes. Thanks. So you all should receive an invitation to join a breakout room.
If anybody's just joining us, go ahead and join a breakout room. These are just to say hello to some of the other participants, get a chance to introduce yourself and learn who else is here. So I'm gonna start closing the rooms because they look, they'll get a 60 second warning and it um, looks like folks might be done. Okay, sounds good. Hi, everybody. Hope you all got to meet somebody you don't know very well. Or maybe, I don't know, you ended up in a room with your next door neighbor on accident. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. I think this is about everyone. Um, hope you enjoyed chatting with each other just a little bit. Uh, the rest of the meeting is going to be mostly listening, so we wanted to give you at least a chance to say hello to each other and feel free to follow up on connections over the chat or after the webinar. Um, my job here is just to give a quick caveat uh, about a big elephant in the room that we're not going to be talking about in our larger agenda of discussing farm finance, and um, that is the economics of carbon markets. So we're really not going to go over this in most of our discussion of how farmers consider their finances, and that has to do basically with the 
number of unknowns that are existing in the markets as they are right now. Um, there are buyers and sellers of both carbon and other ecosystem services through a number of different programs, but the contracts vary a lot in terms of these bullet points I've laid out here, verification processes, the length of the uh, contract, the way data is collected, what eligible practices are and what um, eligible land is in terms of uh, tenant landowner agreements, and then the price of that carbon credit. So we don't have any uh, sort of perfect understanding of, of what those, um, what how those carbon markets will affect farm finances right now. We do know that a lot of the conservation practices that we're interested in, such as reducing tillage and cover crops um, and grazing are eligible for these contracts and that there's some science showing that those practices might increase carbon, um, but the, the way that that's gonna work out financially for farmers feels very much open. Uh, I put these two links in here to uh, guides that I think are really useful if you're interested in this topic. This ISU Iowa State one is a little bit older, um, has a really nice table comparing a lot of different potential programs. And then this newer one from the Farmers Union in Minnesota, the Farmer's Guide to Carbon Market Contracts in Minnesota is also a really good sort of step-by-step -step guide that looks at things from the farmer's perspective if you're um, deciding to choose uh, to sell credits on the market. So that's my caveat about carbon markets. Feel free to follow up with me if you want to talk more about that. Otherwise, we're going to jump into our Farm Finance 101 module, which Paul Dietman from Compure Financial is going to lead. Paul, I'm going to try to stop sharing my screen so that uh, you can share, or maybe you just need to uh, uh, um, jump in there whenever you can. OK. I'm still getting the message I can't share my screen while okay. another participant is sharing. Okay, I'm working on it. Thank you. <laughs> there they are. Hey, I think you should be set. Okay, great. Thanks, Anna. All right. Let's go on here. All right. Well, as Anna said, I'm Paul Dittman. I'm with Compure Financial. Uh, Compure is part of the farm credit system, which is a nationwide network of farmer-owned, farmer-led cooperatives um, that primarily provide um, loans to farmers. We also do crop insurance and some other things, but, but uh, ag lending is really our primary focus. My specific role with Compure, I'm a uh, loan or new markets team, and I co-lead our Emerging Markets Loan Program, which is a loan program for farmers who market their products directly to consumers or who do something in value-added agriculture. And I, I end up working with farmers on um, a lot of farmers who are working uh, using various conservation practices and kind of helping them think through the the finances of those things. Uh, but I'm also making loans every day. And so I wanted to share a little bit more about how farmers view their farm financial management, how lenders look at farm finance, um, how we make loan decisions, how in, in particular, how loan decisions might affect the adoption of conservation practices or how we can finance conservation practices. Um, Feel free to, if you have questions as we go along here, put questions in the chat box. Um, and I don't know if you or Jenny can monitor that. And if there's, if there are questions you wanna um, just interrupt me and, and let me know what they are. Sure, happy to help. Okay, great, thank you. So again, we're gonna start on the, on the farmer side and how farmers think about their finances. These are sort of the basic financial documents on the farm side and, and farmers, some do a really good job. A lot don't do very much on, on the farm finance side. Um, we like to see farmers at least put together enterprise budgets each year. And I'll, I'll show an example of, or two examples actually of crop enterprise budgets here in a second. Um, some farmers do it, some farmers don't. Some do it like back of the envelope, which is totally fine. Just having something down that says, okay, here's what we're expecting for yield. Here's what we think the price is gonna be this year. 
here's what we think all of our expenses are going to be and what sort of profit there might be at the end of the day. Um, I love if a farmer takes those enterprise budgets and then works them into a cash flow projection, a month by month cash flow projection. It's not very common. We do require this when, when we make a micro loan under our emerging markets program because we just want to get farmers sort of in the habit of, of looking at cash flow. When does cash come in? When does cash go out? Are there months that cash is going to be short? If it is, what are we going to do to, to get through those short periods? But again, it's not very common that a farmer will do a 12-month, month-by-month cash flow projection. But I'll show you an example of one here as we go along. Um, Schedule F. So a Schedule F is, is the document uh, that gets filed with the annual tax return with the 1040. Um, it's the profit or loss from farming. And almost every farmer has to file a Schedule F. Um, Balance sheet, I'll talk more about what a balance sheet is here in a minute, but it's basically just a listing of all of your assets, all of your liabilities. If you ever got a home loan, you probably had to fill out a personal financial statement that lists out your cash and checking account balances, your vehicles, any equipment that you might own, any real estate you own. And then on the other side, credit cards, uh, the um, your loans for uh, for vehicles or student loans, that sort of thing. So that's basically a balance sheet. Um, farmers always have to fill out a balance sheet when they come in with a, with a loan request. We try to encourage farmers to fill out a balance sheet every year, though, at least once a year on the first of the year, so that it'll line up with the tax return. And if, if they have the Schedule F and if they have a balance sheet on January 1st every single year, it gives them everything they need to do a full-blown analysis of the farm operation. You can run all sorts of different ratios, figure out where the operation is strong, where it's vulnerable. Um, some farmers are pretty good about, uh, about keeping up on their balance sheet. Others only do it, only update it when they're coming in for a loan request. So here's, um, here are two examples of some enterprise budgets. Um, in this enterprise budget, excuse me, I had to exit something here. Um, on the corn side, we have what we're expecting on the top line, what we expect for gross revenue for the year. And so this farmer is expecting 200 bushel yield at 550 a bushel, which of course that's that's actually a bit high right now, but this uh, this is what they were projecting early in the year. So they're expecting $1,100 per acre gross income. Then we've got a bunch of variable expenses. Variable expenses are costs that you have if you're growing a crop, but you wouldn't have if you're not growing a crop at all. There are the sorts of things that you sit down and you write out a check for every year. So seed, fertilizer, chemicals, fuel, repairs and maintenance on equipment. Um, if there were supplies, that would be included here. Utilities, um, crop drying and storage, hauling marketing, all these things that if they weren't growing a crop at all, they wouldn't have any of these expenses. So what was projected for this year, and this is, I'd say, pretty accurate for most farms, this is about what they're gonna end up uh, spending, about seven, roughly $750 of variable expenses just to put a crop in the ground. Then we have overhead expenses. Overhead expenses, you may, maybe you've heard these referred to as fixed cost. I don't like using the term fixed cost because it, it sort of sets in a person's mind that these costs are fixed, they can never be changed. Um, these are overhead expenses. So they're expenses that a farm is gonna have whether they're producing anything or not. Um, they can be changed though. I mean, there's things like insurance that show up in there. Well, maybe you can, you can get a quote from a different insurance agent, drop your insurance cost or you can make a claim that your property taxes are too high or whatever. So there are ways of changing these overhead expenses, not easy to change, um, but they're true expenses. They're not necessarily cash expenses. So I just want to run down through these things. We've got a land charge here and I've got $300 an acre as a land charge. If you're renting land and that's the going rate for rent in your area, 300 bucks, that's a cash expense. If you own the land and you don't have any debt against it, maybe your only cash expense is property taxes. So your real cash cost isn't $300 an acre. However, we have to, when we do an enterprise budget, we have to figure that in as an opportunity cost because the farmer could rent that land out for $300 an acre and then not have any of the variable expenses, not have anything to worry about, go work in town or go fishing every day or whatever they wanna do and they don't have to um, have to worry about growing a crop. So it is an opportunity cost. If you could rent it out for 300 an acre, you should, in your enterprise budget, charge your enterprise $300 an acre. Um, the next thing we have in is, is uh, economic depreciation of capital assets. So you've got, if you're growing a uh, corn crop, you've got expenses, you've got a tractor, you've got a planter, you maybe have a combine, 
um, you have tillage equipment, all those sorts of things. And those things, as you use them in the farming enterprise, are depreciating. They're losing some value every year, a little bit, because they start wearing out. And at some point, they're going to have to be renovated or replaced. So we put in an economic depreciation of capital assets. We're putting in 50 bucks an acre there. Um, I mentioned before insurance. So your property and casualty insurance. Can't really split that out necessarily to each individual enterprise. So we spread these out over all the enterprises. Um, insurance, repairs on buildings, property taxes, that all shows up in here. We've got $20 an acre there. Interest on farm loans. So if there's a loan for equipment or if there's a mortgage on the farm, we're going to um, factor that in as interest on farm loans, and that's $30 an acre. These last two, uh, return on the farmer's equity and return on unpaid labor and management. Those are things that, that most farmers, even if they do a pretty good job of enterprise budgeting, probably aren't going to put in here. If the farmer has a bunch of assets tied up and they've got some debt against those assets, we take the assets minus liabilities, it gives us the equity that the farmer has in the, in the farm operation. That equity, there's an opportunity cost to it. They could take the equity out, they could go invest it someplace, get a return on that equity. Well, if they're gonna use all those assets, use that equity, tie that equity up in the farm operation, they should get a return on that equity. And here we're putting in $50 an acre on that. And then return on unpaid labor and management. A lot of farmers just say, well, whatever's left at the end of the day, that's what I get paid. And if there's nothing, I don't get paid. Well, when we do an enterprise budget, we have to factor in what the value of their labor is. Um, again, there's an opportunity cost. If they're investing labor in their corn enterprise, um, if they decided to rent the, the land out, they could take their labor and go to town and, and make 20 bucks an hour or whatever it is. And so I've got in here, I'm, I'm factoring $15 an hour times two hours per acre for their corn enterprise budget. So that's $30. So the total overhead expense is here, $480. Um, the return per acre that we're projecting. So this is the farmer sitting down in the spring saying, I think I can get 200 bushel yield. I think the price is going to be 550. I think here's all my variable costs, my overhead costs. And I'm projecting I'm going to lose $128 an acre on this enterprise. Um, we calculate two break-even costs. We want to factor or figure out the break-even price to cover the variable costs. If we can't at least cover all those variable costs like seed and fertilizer and chemicals, all that stuff, if we can't at least cover that, it's telling us we absolutely should rent the land out. There's no reason to grow a crop of corn because we, we will never be able to, um, to recoup our, our uh, uh, variable costs, much less our overhead costs. In this case, the break-even price to cover a variable costs. What we're doing here is we're taking the $748 and we're dividing it by the number of bushels. And it's saying, okay, well, if we can get 374 a bushel for corn, we're going to cover all of those variable costs, and we're going to actually make some contribution towards those overhead expenses. We're not going to fully cover them because we've already projected we're going to lose $128 an acre. But the break-even price we would need, the corn price we would need if we get 200 bushel yield and, the, um, and everything else works out exactly as we, as we anticipated it would, we need to get $6.14 a bushel. Not very likely this year. And in a lot of parts of the state, um, I know we're, I'm in Prairie du Sac, Wisconsin. We're in the 3% of the state that's in extreme drought right now. There's no way we're getting 200 bushel yields around here. Even irrigated corn isn't going to bring that. So um, the chances of getting 614 a bushel um, and having the 200 bushel yield are about zero. So we're projecting at the beginning of the year, losing $128 an acre growing corn. On the soybean side, I won't go into quite as much detail. I kind of want to um, explain how enterprise budgeting works. But on the soybean side, we're expecting 50 bushel yield times $13 a bushel. So the gross revenue per acre we're expecting is $650. We have all the variable expenses, those total 403. The overhead expenses are the same because it's same acres, whether we plant those acres to corn or to soybeans, all the overhead expenses are still the same. We have the same opportunity cost of land and all that stuff. We're expecting a loss of 233 bushel or $233 an acre, excuse me, on soybeans. Of course, soybean price has come up quite a bit from, from what we were projecting. It's uh, around here, it's over 14 right now. Um, but still, <clears throat> we're still in drought situation. So, uh, so return per acre is still likely to be pretty negative. We calculate the break-even price to cover the variable cost, 806. So we've got that covered. But we're going to need to get uh, soybean price to 1766 a bushel to cover all of our costs. 
So this is a year that we're not gonna cover overhead expenses. We'll be lucky that we cover the variable costs. So how can farmers afford to grow crops that appear to be losing money? I mean, we just showed that these, both of these crops look like they're gonna lose money. Um, you know, a farmer might say, well, I'll grow more corn because I'm gonna lose less money on corn than I'm gonna lose on soybeans. Well, how do they afford to do that? Because again, a lot of these overhead expenses aren't necessarily cash expenses. If you own your land, you might say, well, my real cost of land is only the property taxes and maybe that's $25 an acre or something. And economic depreciation, eh, you know, I can't really feel that. I don't have to sit down and write a check out for that. So I, I'm going to ignore that. Insurance repairs taxes, those actually have to be paid. The interest on farm loans has to be paid. But return on equity, return on unpaid labor and management, farmers often just don't even think of this as, as true expenses. But they are. Again, there's opportunity costs here. Um, so those are enterprise budgets. What I love to have farmers do is then take those enterprise budgets and build them into a cash flow projection and look at month by month, how much cash is going to come in, how much cash is going to go out, are we going to be short, and then what are we going to do if we're short of cash. So the way that you read this, this is a cash flow projection for uh, 2023. The farm is growing 500 acres, half corn, half beans. They've only got one loan on the farm, and that's a machinery note. It's five years at 7% uh, with an annual payment. I'll show that here in a minute where that payment shows up. Um, and then they've got to take an operating loan to cover their operating expenses through the year. So we're starting in January with $20,000 in the farm checking account. There's no money that comes in in the month of January. Got some expenses. They're doing some repairs on machinery in the middle of winter. They've got utility costs. Um, they're taking a family living draw. It's not much, $12.50 a month, but it's cash that's leaving the farm enterprise. So they're ending the month with $13,417 in the checking account. And then that begins February. So we've got $13,417, no cash comes in, got some expenses, still doing more repairs, still have to pay utilities, still have to take something to live on. Now they're down to $98.34. In March, they're starting to tap their operating loan. So they're taking $70,000 from the operating loan. They have an insurance bill they have to pay. Um, they still have some repairs and maintenance, but the biggest expense they have that month is they're paying for their seed. So that's 53,750. Still utilities, still taking something out. Now they're down to 8501. That in the month of April, they're hitting the operating loan again, 110,000 because they're paying for fertilizer and lime. They're supply or laying in a supply of fuel. Um, the month of May, they're taking another 5,000 out of the operating loan because again, there's no cash coming in from the farm enterprise. And we're not showing any off-farm income in this scenario. I want to keep it kind of clean and just look at the, at the farm enterprises. And then uh, June, they have to tap the operating loan for 40000 And then July, 5000 So you can see how they start building up that operating loan balance every, every couple of months or every month in the summer. Um, and they, uh, they don't have any income really coming in until they start selling crops. And here they sell... Um, crops in November for 275,000. They sell crops in December for 162.5. Um, they had some expenses that had to be paid in that in those months. Um, this is custom hire, so they had to hire a combine to come in and harvest their crops for them. But then we get out here, 293. They paid back the operating loan. They made the annual payment on um, on that equipment loan, and they get down to the end of the year and they've got 104,000 in the checking account. So this just kind of gives you a sense of how cash flows in and out. We're talking a 500 acre enterprise. And even at that scale, $230,000 of operating that they had to cover with an operating loan, plus they burned through 20,000 of their own cash. So essentially $250,000 of expenses during the year to get to the point where they've got crops to sell at the end of the year. And it turns out to be from a cash flow standpoint, um, a, not a bad year. They're, they ended the year with uh, 84,000 more in cash than they started the year. So I'm going to stop there for just a second and see if there are any questions about either the enterprise budgets or the cash flow. And feel free to put your questions in the chat or you can just shout them out too. Question in the chat, how common is a scenario like this one? 
It's pretty common. Yeah, it's uh, most farmers aren't sitting on a lot of cash. So, you know, they, in fact, in this case, we show them starting with $20,000 of cash in the checking account that I would say that's pretty typical for a farm about this size. Um, you know, there up until now, there really hasn't been much incentive to hold on to cash. You know, if, if a farmer had excess cash, they would probably pay down some debt or they would maybe buy some equipment or do building repairs or whatever. But there hasn't been a lot of incentive to, to just hold cash. Of course, now um, cash is, is actually generating a not, not too bad return. If you can get, you know, four to five percent sitting on cash, there's a little bit more incentive to hold on to some cash. But it is pretty typical that they'll they won't have a lot of cash to start with. They tap their operating loans when they need to and then pay them back after the crops are sold. The last couple of years have actually been pretty strong years in conventional agriculture. If you look back the last 50 years, um, look at the four most profitable years in the last 50 years, two of the four most profitable years were 2021 and 2022. And that was in 2021, there were a lot of government payments that went to farmers. Um, there was the PPP loans, there was EIDL loans, there was other uh, COVID relief. We were still kind of on the tail end of the, the, um, the trade adjustment payments that resulted from the, the trade war with China. Um, so 2021, part of the reason that farmers made a lot of money is because they had a lot of government payments that went into their pockets. 2022, we had the, the war in Ukraine broke out early in 2022, drove crop prices through the roof. Here in Wisconsin, most places across the state had ideal growing conditions. So we had good yields and we had great prices. And so there was a lot of cash that went into farmers' pockets in 2022 also. Uh, 23, obviously not going to be anywhere near those two years. And it's really unusual to have two really strong years back to back like we did. So we, we saw last year um, operating loan usage really went down because farmers did have the cash to put their crops in without having to tap their operating loans. But otherwise, this is this is a pretty typical scenario. So someone asked specifically, is it common that they take out an operating loan every year? It is, yeah, for row crop operations, it's very common. Um, I work mostly with smaller scale farms and even a lot of my small scale farms have operating loans. They might be smaller operating loans, they're not 250,000, but they might be you know, anywhere from 10 to 100,000. And they're, they've got expenses that have to be paid early in the year and they don't have any revenue coming in until later in the year. And they have to live on something during that time period too, you have to pay all of your bills. And so, um, yeah, it is, it is pretty common that farmers take operating loans. The other questions in the chat, one is that, are there templates available for this? Yeah, this template here, I'm happy to share. Um, this, is a, this is a template that um, actually my wife put together for me. Um, yeah, and I, I've shared it with lots and lots of farmers. I was working on this myself, trying to, I was trying to put together a cash flow projection spreadsheet that, that sort of lined up with a Schedule F. And if you look at the Schedule F profit or loss from farming, um, the categories in this cash flow really do pretty much line up with the Schedule F. Um, she's a lot better at, at Excel than I am. And uh, so I was sitting here at the, at the island and I'm putzing around with this and, and she keeps walking by looking at me and, um, <clears throat> excuse me. And she said, uh, what are you trying to do? And I explained it to her. She's like, get out of the way. She sat down in five minutes, she put this together. And I've shared this with literally thousands of farmers. And so I'm, I'm more than happy to share it with you. If you, if you want a copy, send me that a message. That is a great story, Paul. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One other comment on here. Someone asked, what would a conservation practice line item look like in the enterprise or cash flow spreadsheet? Kind of gets to the heart of what we're doing here. Right. Yeah. Um, conservation practice where where it typically will show up, um, it'll the cost share will show up in under government payments. Um, the expenses could show up anywhere. It could be custom hire. It could be um, chemicals. I mean, it could be seed and plants. You know, supplies. So it, it could the actual expenses could show up anywhere in here. If the farmer needs to take a loan to put in those practices, I'm going to show or talk about two examples here as we go along of how we would look at financing conservation practices that are being cost shared. Um, but, you know, we would end up uh, taking proceeds from a new loan up here. And then if it's capital expenses, let's say um, someone is adopting managed grazing and so they have to put in fencing and watering system. I'm gonna put that in as a capital purchase because those are things that, that have a long life. They, they'll 
last for well more than a year. So those are going to show up more as a capital purchase. Great. Yeah, I'll, I'll show some examples as we go on. Okay. And someone wants to know how likely smaller farms are to receive these operating loans. And so maybe talking about the spectrum of operating loans that you might receive, you know, if you have like 10 acres of vegetables or 50 acres of livestock, are you still eligible and likely to receive an operating loan? Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, we make we make some really small operating loans under the Emerging Markets Program. Um, I think maybe the smallest one I've done is $5,000. You know, so it's, um, and we tend to look more at the at the purpose of the loan than we do at the scale of the operation. Um, although I should I should also say that it's not necessarily typical. If you were um, a small scale grower in Illinois, walked into one of our offices, you grow on three acres of vegetables. Down there, you know, they might be working with really large operations, and and to make a five thousand dollar operating loan, they may not be. Um, I, you know, they're probably not going to really work hard on something like that. But under our emerging markets program, that's really what the program is designed for. So we'll, um, someone will come in and they say, okay, well, I need, I need $20,000. And then the more we talk, the $20,000, 15 of it is for a hoop house and 5,000 of it is for operating expenses. In that case, we'll write two loans. We'll make an operating loan for 5,000 to cover those annual operating expenses. And then we'll do a $15,000 loan to put in the hoop house. And that'll have longer term payments. And I'll talk more about those loans too and how they work. Uh, it's like the better let you keep going so that you can uh, get to some of these questions naturally. Uh, sure. Thanks for the questions, everybody. Yeah, thank you. That's great. That helps. Okay, um, one other point I wanted to make here. So we started with 20000 in the checking account. We ended with 104000 in the checking account. So we added $84,000 of cash, um, which is great. But you know, you think about the opportunity cost from the enterprise budgets, we could have rented this land out for $300 an acre, right? And times 500 acres, that's $150,000. So we could have just rented the land out, cashed a rent check, gone to town and worked, not had to worry about any of all these operating expenses, not taking an operating loan, any of that. So just wanted to, to put that in your mind. I mean, it's um, it's why we think about uh, the operate or the opportunity cost of the land, um, because there's sometimes when it it would make a lot more economic sense to maybe just go ahead and rent it out. So we had the enterprise budgets, we had that cash flow projection. When the farmer did their tax return at the end of the year, this is what it's likely to look like. So they had. Sales of crops, $437,500. They had a bunch of expenses, you know, um, and these don't necessarily exactly line up with the expenses on the, on the cash flow because the Schedule F is not really a cash statement. It sort of is, sort of isn't. There are some non-cash items that show up in here like um, tax depreciation versus economic depreciation. There's things that farmers can do with their taxes to accelerate depreciation on equipment and things like that. So this, this isn't gonna necessarily exactly line up. And it's, it can be confusing for a farmer too, because they'll say, okay, well, I did my enterprise budgets. It looked like I was gonna lose $100, you know, $130 or whatever, 123, whatever it was on corn. I was gonna lose 233 on beans. Then I did my cash flow projection and it looked like I was gonna add $84,000 of cash. And then if I do my tax return, I actually ended up with a net profit according to the IRS of 107,000 which one of those numbers is right? I mean, they're all different and they're all right. That's what's confusing. It's they're all right for the purposes that they're being used for, but that's why we have to do more than just a tax return or more than just enterprise budgets because we have to look at this from a little bit different perspectives to see how is this really gonna work out? Then I mentioned balance sheet. And so um, we try to encourage our farmers to do a balance sheet on the first of each year. If they do that, um, it's going to line up with the tax return. You'll have a, a beginning of the year balance sheet and an end of the year balance sheet. And I won't get into all the, the ratios and things that we can calculate from those, those two balance sheets with the tax return, but just suffice it to say that if you have those three documents and the IRS is going to force you to do your Schedule F, if you can force yourself to do a January 1 balance sheet every year, you'll have everything you need to do a full analysis of the farm operation, figure out where it's strong, figure out where it's vulnerable, 
how to make changes um, to improve the, the profitability, the cash flow, some of the other ratios that we can calculate. But um, I just a couple of things I wanted to point out here. So they started the year with $20,000 in the checking account. This is January 1st of 2023. They had $600,000 in machinery. They had 500 acres of land at $8 or $8,000 an acre, excuse me. That's $4 million. So total assets, uh, 4.6 million roughly. They have principal due, oops. They have principal due on farm loans of 37,000 at the beginning of the year. Um, so total current liabilities, we consider that a current liability, that's 37,000. It's, it's something that's due within the next year's time. And then here's the longer term balance on that machinery loan. So their net worth, $4.4 million, which is fantastic. Remember, we showed that they had 104,000 in the checking account at the end of the year. So January 1 of 2024, here's that 104,000. I didn't change the machinery, I didn't change the land value. Uh, but now their, their total assets are 4.7. Um, principal due on term loans actually went up because as those loans get paid off, the interest drops, the principal increases. So there's a little more principal due within the next year on that loan. But the longer term balance has come down. That's 138,000 now. So we get down to the bottom line, their net worth is 4.5 million. So they added quite a bit of, of net worth, you know, and, and again, doesn't necessarily exactly line up with the cash flow or with the tax return or with the enterprise budgets, but they, they did end the year uh, much better than they started the year. You know, they were at 4.4 million at, at the beginning of the year, they're at uh, 4.526 at the end. So that's all on the farm side. Now I wanna talk about the farm lender side of, of the equation here. And first, I just wanna talk about a couple things about farm lending, the way that we think about farm lending. Um, number one, farm loans are commercial rather than consumer. So um, consumer loans, if you get a home loan, that's a consumer loan. You get a personal vehicle loan, that's a consumer loan. There are a lot of regulations on the consumer lending side, and especially on the, on the consumer mortgage side since the housing crisis of 08, um, there's been a lot more regulation on the consumer lending side. Commercial loans, there aren't as many regulations. It's, it's a bit looser. Um, interest rates tend to be higher on the commercial side. Typically a commercial loan rate will be one to 2% higher than a consumer loan rate. So occasionally someone will say, well, I, I heard that um, a 30 year home mortgage is at 6% right now, but you're telling me that a farm uh, 30 year fixed rate mortgage is at seven and a half percent. Why is that? Why is there such a big difference? It's because it's commercial rather than consumer. Um, farm lending tends to be relational rather than transactional. You know, if you if you buy a house, um, you get a mortgage from a bank or from a, a mortgage broker, you may talk to them a lot for a couple of weeks, and then you may never talk to them again. In farm lending, we're doing an operating loan. A lot of times we're renewing the operating loan every year, or maybe it's every three years, or we do an operating loan and then the farmer's buying a piece of equipment, or they're buying a neighbor's piece of ground or something. And so there tends to be a lot of, of um, transactions that happen and it's very relational lending. We'll have our clients call us and ask questions about like just all sorts of finance topics that even, even if they're not asking for a loan, they just trust that we know something about finances and about numbers. And if they're thinking about doing something, making an investment or whatever, a lot of times they'll call just to kick those ideas around. So it's very relational. Um, if I go out to close a loan, it's pretty typical. We might spend five minutes closing the loan and we spend an hour and a half talking about everything else under the sun. We talk about the Packers, we talk about families, we talk about fishing or whatever. I mean, it's all sorts of stuff. It's really, I, I love doing what I do because it is very relational. It's not transactional. People think that lenders are selling loans and I don't think about what we do in that way. We're actually buying debt obligations. People are coming to us and they're trying to sell us on the idea of providing them with, with loans or with debt, or we're renting them the use of money, essentially. So we're not out selling loans, but we're buying people's debt. We can't buy everybody's debt. We want to buy as much as we can because that's the way the co-op makes money. Um, and it's, it's something that's necessary for farmers to, um, to advance their, their operations and their careers. Um, but we can't necessarily buy everyone's debt. We want exposure to a lot. We want to see everybody's every opportunity and see what we can do if we can make it work. If we can't, 
again, we go back to the relational piece of it. And, and there are times when I make a loan and then someone comes back and they need another loan and I can't make that loan. And it's explaining why we can't do it right now. It's putting them in a more risky situation. We wanna see the, the ratios get to a certain point. Here's what it's gonna to take to get to that point. So, uh, so we're not really selling loans, we're really buying debt. There's a fair amount of subjectivity and creativity in farm lending. And I think that's something that people would, are surprised to hear if they don't know anything about farm lending. Um, it's not just throwing something into the pot and the underwriter just runs numbers on it and says yes or no. There's a lot of subjectivity and creativity in trying to figure out, okay, what's the best way to structure something? Or maybe uh, someone's asking for 100,000, 80,000 might be work better for their cash flow. Or maybe improvements need to be staged over time instead of trying to take on too much debt too quickly. So there's, there's a lot of subjectivity and creativity in, in the work. This is one example, and this is a, this is a um, conservation practice example that I wanted to share with you. Um, I've been working with a community of farmers in Pembroke, Illinois. Pembroke, Illinois is um, it's near Kankakee. It's uh, east of Kankakee County, or it's in Kankakee County, Illinois, which is south of Chicago, roughly 50 miles or so. It's the, um, the western half of Kankakee County is typical Illinois farmland. It's flat, it's deep loam, it's beautiful land, it's really productive. You get into Pembroke, which is in the eastern side of Kankakee County, right along the Indiana border, and it's really sandy, it's poor quality soil, um, tough to grow crops there. The, the area was settled at the time of the Great Migration, um, mostly by black farmers who'd moved up from the south and moved into that area because the land was cheap. Nobody else wanted that land. It was really inexpensive to purchase it. It was great for growing vegetables uh, because it was so sandy and it was close enough to the, the south shore of Lake Michigan that um, farmers who live there could work in the steel mills or in the, um, in the other factories along the south shore of the lake. Um, we're now down to several generations uh, of farmers who are of landowners in that Pembroke region. And there's a group that's trying to bring people back to farming. Um, the land has been passed down from generation to generation. A lot of people have left the area, maybe still own the land, rent it out or, or don't, or just let it sit. Um, so there's a group that's trying to get farmers to, to start growing in that community again. And they've gotten an RCPP contract. So, um, or a project, excuse me. So, and there's, there's a probably a dozen landowners there that are part of the RCPP, uh, Regional Conservation Partnership Program, which I'm sure most of you on, the, on this webinar know. Um, the challenge that, that the farmers face is these are really small projects. Most of them are 10 to $15,000. Even though they're relatively small projects, the farmers have to put the money up, up front. Most of them are doing uh, perennial plantings. They might be putting in fruit crops or um, building hoop houses, things like that they don't have 10 to $15,000 of cash sitting in the bank to pay for the expenses and then go back to NRCS and ask for reimbursement. By the same token, they don't have any collateral to pledge to secure a loan. So what we've done in this case is we've entered into assignment of payment contracts with the farmers. So Compeer is actually paying the expenses to the, uh, from the vendors. So someone built, wants to put up a hoop house, we pay the hoop house vendor and then we turn around and ask for reimbursement from an RCS. It does two things. The farmer obviously doesn't have any collateral to pledge and we're not taking any collateral. We're only using that, those contract payments as the collateral to secure the loan. And um, the farmer didn't have the cash to put up up front, so they don't have to worry about that. We're providing the cash up front. Um, it's also helping those farmers build some credit with us because they, they technically have operating loans with us even though they won't necessarily have any money flow through their hands, it's going directly from us to the vendor and then from NRCS back to us, but it's helping them build some credit with us. So in the future, if they need, um, need financing for something else, we can be there for them. So just an example of, of something that we can do that's a bit more creative. We've never really done that before. And the first time I put one of these through, um, our doc prep team came back and said, what are you taking as collateral here? You didn't list anything. And I said, well, we're only taking this contract as collateral. We had to figure out internally how we made that work, but we figured it out and, and now we can do this with other farmers. Okay, any questions on that? I'll have another example of, of uh, how we can finance conservation practices a little bit later in the presentation too.
I'll just say we'd like to start Sarah promptly at 11. So can you pay attention to time for your last section here? And maybe yeah. the rest of the questions will have to go in the chat. Okay, gotcha. Thanks, Anna. All right. So we're going to uh, dig just a little bit deeper on the farm lending side. Um, Want to start off, you know, I mentioned I, I work for the farm credit system. So Compure Financial, we, we cover northern Illinois, about two thirds of Wisconsin, the eastern half of Minnesota. Our system, there's a farm credit cooperative like ours in every part of the country and in part of Puerto Rico, excuse me. Um, our system holds about 44% of all the farm debt in the country. All banks put together hold about 35% of the debt. Individuals, the FSA, dealer financing, insurance companies and so forth, they hold about 20%. And then non-regulated alternative lenders hold less than 1%. So it kind of gives you a sense of, of the scale of lending and who's who really is in this business in farm lending. Um, the sorts of farm loans that are available, operating loans, we've talked about those. Those are typically revolving lines of credit. They're used to cover annual operating expenses. The interest rate on an operating loan is variable, so it can change each month. And right now with the Fed raising rates, every time the Fed raises rates a, a quarter percent, we raise the, the rate on variable uh, rate operating loans by a quarter of a percent, and they'll go down the same way. Um, they're really supposed to be used for operating expenses, though. We don't want to see people put equipment on an operating loan because it's supposed to be paid to zero every year. It's supposed to be paid back with the proceeds from the sale of farm products. Um, term loans are loans that are used for purchase of equipment or breeding livestock, vehicles. Interest rates on those loans can either be fixed for the entire term or they can be adjustable rates, which means they might be fixed for three years if it's a three-year adjustable rate. And then at the end of three years, it adjusts to whatever the current rate is at that point. And then real estate loans, those are long-term loans up to 30 years. That could be for purchase of land or for construction of buildings. And the interest rates on those, again, are either fixed or adjustable. So what kind of financial information is the lender going to need to take a loan application? We're going to want to see a current balance sheet. That's, that's a pretty much a must across the board. Beyond that, we're probably gonna ask for three years of the tax returns, kind of depends. If it's real estate, we always ask for three years of tax returns. In emerging markets, most of the time we don't get tax returns. We might ask for an income statement from a prior year or from the prior year and projected income statement for this year. We might ask for that month by month cash flow projection that I showed. We're gonna ask for detailed assumptions to back up the financial projections. Explanation of financing needs, a, probably a business plan. Um, and doesn't need to be huge. We, with the emerging markets, we uh, ask for a business plan that's like one to two pages. So pretty simple. We take all that financial information and then we're, we're looking at these five C's of credit, we call them. Um, character, so that's where we pull a credit report, look at credit score. Capital is looking at the balance sheet. Capacity is looking at cash flow. Collateral, what sort of collateral to secure the loan in case someone doesn't make the loan payments and then any conditions that we might put on, uh, on the loan approval. Put those five things together and that's where we get the loan decision. So it isn't all just about the numbers, there's more to it than that. So how does a farmer improve their odds of getting a quick approval? Um, a strong credit score, the FICO score. Um, above 750 is ideal, 670 is sort of our minimum. We can use offsetting strengths to go below uh, 670, but. 670 is really pretty much the low end. Keeping good farm records, prevent, uh, presenting complete, succinct, accurate financial information, not providing too much information, um, bring all the information in at one time or respond quickly to, to requests for more information. Sometimes people sort of dribble information in. We get a balance sheet today, we get a cash flow next month, you know, and then they wanna know why we haven't approved the loan yet. So um, try to bring everything in at once. Um, treating the lender as a potential business partner because we really are a business partner. We're we're renting you the use of money, and uh, and we we want to make sure that you're stewarding it in the right way, and then be open to advice. Um, how might we finance a conservation project? So let's say that a farmer needs fifty thousand dollars for a project. Let's say they're they're adopting managed grazing. They have to put in fencing and water system and some other things. They need fifty thousand for the project. They expect to be reimbursed for 70% of the cost of the project. So that's 35,000. We'd likely break that into two loans. We'd write a $35,000 operating loan because that's gonna get paid back pretty quickly. You know, They're gonna expend the money, they're gonna apply for a reimbursement, you're gonna send them a check and, and then they're gonna pay off the operating loan. 
So we'd set that up as an operating loan. It's not gonna have regular principal and interest payments. Interest only accrues when there's a balance on the loan. When the farmer gets reimbursed, they pay off the entire amount and we're done. Um, even if the loan was maxed out for 60 days, so they took the full 35,000, held it for, uh, or used it for 60 days, then paid it back. The interest cost, depending on the interest rate, would be between four and $500 for that, that two month time frame. Um, that last 15,000, because that's not being reimbursed, that's something that the farmer is gonna have to hold for a longer term. We might set that up on a five-year term loan with an 8% fixed interest rate with an annual payment. The annual payment on that loan will be 3756. So that's kind of how we would look at, at financing something that was more of a capital project um, rather than, than something like um, cover cropping or whatever. So, Alternatives to conventional loans, um, there's USDA FSA, and we partner with FSA a lot. Um, they're great to work with, especially here in Wisconsin. Um, USDA Rural Development Snop Option, Small Business Administration, I, I'm not a fan. I would really discourage a farmer from working with the SBA. Um, there are other options too, though. County Regional Economic Development Agencies, they're non-regulated lenders equity investments from family or friends. There's CDFIs, Community Development Financial Institutions. Um, there are a few of them in Wisconsin that will do work with, uh, with farmers. Um, not real common for CDFIs to work with farmers, but some do. And then um, grants, EQIP, Value Added Producer Grant and others. And then um, long-term leases as opposed to buying land or buying machinery or, or even putting up a building uh, can be an option. Couple of last things I just wanna say about conservation finance and then I'll end it. Uh, from the farmer side, my experience, farmers rarely make decisions based purely on economics. So you, they might say, oh, I'm only, I only look at the numbers. Nah, they usually will use economics to justify decisions they've already made. So if they're thinking about adopting conservation practices, cost sharing can add sort of the icing on the cake, but the farmer, you can't throw enough cost sharing dollars at a farmer to to adopt a conservation practice that they don't really want to adopt uh, in the first place. Uh, a basic understanding of farm finances on your side as conservation professionals will pay big dividends. Farmers, they know you understand the conservation side, but if you can show that you also understand the finance side too and what, they're, what they face every day um, on, when it comes to dollars and cents and cash in and cash out, um, that's, that'll, uh, take you far. It'll it'll help you build more credibility with your farmers. Um, you know, we showed those variable costs anywhere from 400 or so for soybeans up to 750 an acre um, for corn. You know, if you think about cost sharing for something like like cover cropping, and it's 30 or 40 dollars an acre, it's such a small percentage of the amount of money that's flowing through that operation every year. Is it really going to make a whole lot of difference? It, again, it's icing on the cake, but it's not going to be the cake. Um, it is possible to finance conservation practices on rented land. So yeah, just because someone's renting land doesn't mean that they can't get a loan to do what they want to do. And then finally, when a farmer says banks don't want to lend to organic farmers or banks don't want to lend to regenerative farmers or grazing farmers or whatever, don't assume that the farming practice is the issue. We don't necessarily have a bias as, as a lending institution against organic farming, but we don't want to make bad credit risks. And, and that's generally what, what uh, is happening if, if farmers say that. From the lender side, a farm lender can influence conservation decisions even if there's no loan proposal. You know, I mentioned how this is relational lending. And so we're helping farmers make decisions on a lot of financial things. And they can, the lenders can influence conservation decisions even if the farmer isn't asking for a loan to put those practices uh, in. Don't assume that lenders know about your programs or how your programs work, even if the lenders are also farmers. A lot of my colleagues are farmers and I'm surprised at how little some of them know about farm uh, programs. So don't assume that they know what EQIP is or that county land conservation departments have cost sharing dollars available. They may not know that. Invite lenders to field days and workshops. Again, they can influence decisions. Um, so welcome them in and have them come to those, those events. Um, and finally, if you ever need sponsorship for events, a lot of times lenders have, have some discretionary funds to put into um, sponsoring some events. So, and then I'm gonna close here, um, where to get more information about the economics of conservation practices. The Soil Health Nexus, this project that we're a part of that, that is behind this webinar today, 
um, has pulled together a bunch of resources into this hub. And it's the Conservation Finance and Finance Resource Hub. It's at the Soil Health Nexus. If you search either of those terms, you're gonna find it. Um, SARE has done some good work on cover crop economics. American Farmland Trust has some soil health case studies that I really like that show some partial budget analysis of adopting different practices, really easy to understand for a farmer. Um, and then the Soil Health Partnership um, has some stuff too. Okay, well, that's all I've got. Pretty good, Paul. You've got some meaty questions in the chat. I hope while Sarah's during her presentation, you can take some time to type out some answers because sure. they are good questions. All right. Yeah. Sarah, can you start to share your screen? I'm going to do a quick poll for everybody. Um, just curious how many, um, how many of you have people you talk to about conservation topics? Sarah, you go ahead and share your screen as people are answering. We're working on it here. I understand. I'm blessed at this stuff. <laughs> okay, that's what I'm going to do. Sorry, hang on, Anna, I'll get there. Okay. While we're waiting, Paul, do you want to say anything about these questions around whether there is reduced risk for lenders um, when conservation practices are part of the, the farm plan? Yeah, so maybe I'll start at the top with the, the last question that I don't think we answered during the presentation. That's what percentage of lenders help farmers fill out balance sheet and cash flow calculations? I'd say most do. You know, we might ask the farmer to come in with sort of a basic balance sheet, but then we'll help them um, help them uh, fill it out from there. We don't expect it to be perfect when they come in. Um, let's see, and same with cash flows too. Sarah, we're still seeing your notes and stuff. I don't know if you're able mm. to stop and try again where we can. Okay. The slides. Like it's it's okay. Give me one second. Take your time. And Paul, keep going as long as you're able. Okay. <laughs> I think this question of whether there is reduced risk is really of interest to people. Oh, okay. <clears throat> so will the, will the use of conservation practices provide less risk to lenders due to increased crop resilience or yields and therefore allow for lower interest rates? I think long-term, that's going to happen. It maybe doesn't happen so much right now, but we certainly see that um, that we need more resilience in our soils. We need, you know, especially like a year like this around here, if you were cover cropping, you could capture an inch of rainfall and hold it on your on your land instead of letting it run off. Um, you're going to be so much better off, and which means you're probably going to be more profitable, which means you're probably going to have better cash flow. And ultimately, those are the things that are going to lead to a lower interest rate. So there's there's a lot of talk right now in the lending world on ESG, environmental, social, governments, go, uh, governance issues, excuse me. Um, and so there's there's a lot more attention being paid by lenders to those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, Sarah, looks like you were up and running, so we'll let. I'm you almost know. there. I'm trying to get to the beginning. <laughs> Beginning. Well, yeah, I have I, never had this many much problem with getting this to do this. So. Um, all right. I literally can't hang on one second here. It is not responding to. Oh, that's why. I know why now. All right. Now we're good. Okay. So, <laughs> you know, you may not like Excel. I'm not good at, you know, Zoom, Paul. <laughs> So, um, Sarah, you to introduce yourself briefly. Yeah. yeah, so my name is Sarah Horner. I am an ag lender, kind of like Paul, but I work for a community bank in central Illinois, about 100 miles south of Chicago. Um, we're a small community bank, family owned and ran for a little over 100 years still. Um, our bank and our specifically our ag department is big into diversification. And that means organic specialty growers, um, kind of like Paul, we work with smaller farmers, 
um, up to bigger farmers. I think probably one of our smallest lines, probably 5,000, our largest ones go into seven figures. So it's really right across the board. Um, diversification for us also means maybe livestock, or you know maybe it's if you can't make the money work, you have an off-farm job altogether. So, but we like to do the diversification for farms because it really brings in the next generation and uh, cash flows to bring in the next generation other than just doing conventional corn and soybeans, which in our area is king. Corn and soybeans are everywhere. Although I have seen a lot of wheat fields this year as, as far as harvest goes and everything. So, um, Paul is a wonderful resource and he, he was sitting here and I didn't have my camera on, but I was just sitting here shaking my head to a lot of that of what Paul said. So um, if you're ever talking to a lender, don't be afraid to bring up equip loans and stuff like that because you just never know what lenders know. Um, I also farm on the side. So I do conventional uh, corn and soybeans. And so a lot of these conversations, when I talk about landlord con tenant considerations, it's stuff that I have mentioned to my landlord. Um, and sometimes that goes well, and sometimes it doesn't. And it's my dad. And so I have to deal with it no matter what. Um, so um, I kind of got pulled into this last minute. I was looking, I was uh, helping the lawyer that was going to present here and um, she ended up not being able to do it. And so what I have done, because I am not a farm manager, I'm a lender, um, is I have talked to about four, uh, three or four of our farm managers that we have used for our newsletters and we talk to on a regular basis if we have questions on leases or um, cover crops or organics, or we have a, land, a farm uh, management um, landlord that wants to do some of these practices. Um, so at the very end of my presentation, I have put their contact information. So I'm going to do the best I can for you. It was kind of on short notice, um, and hopefully you'll get something out of this. I encourage questions. Um, and um, and I would also like your thoughts if you've ever dealt with some of this stuff. So with that being said, I have to remember them. Okay, this is kind of our agenda today. We're going to talk about landowner considerations, tenant considerations, land considerations, some types of leases, um, some tips on leases from the farm managers I talked to. And then the last part of this presentation, it, I hope you're sharing this, Anna, with them because it's all the legal parts of leases. And I will not be going over that, but I, I think it's good information if you want to know. Um, and the original, the lawyer who originally put this together is from Arkansas. So some of these are state law based. So no kind of that it may not um, really pertain to you in Minnesota or Wisconsin or wherever you're at. So with that, um, as far as landowner, this is really common. We will get a landowner who um, wants to do the conservation practices and is not sure how to go about getting um, their tenant to do it. I sit in on a lot of women landowner meetings, women farmer meetings. And in a lot of these cases, these women's, these women probably women, women probably in, uh, inherited the ground, right? And they know they wanna do cover crops and they're not sure how to go about um, talking to their farmer tenant about it, right? If you have a farm manager, or if you're lurking at the landowner, these are some of the things you need to keep into consideration. One is risk level. What is the tolerance of uh, that they can have for risk um, based on the financial reward, right? Is the farm ground their main source of income? So um, the one farm manager gave an example of is if, if the landowner relies on this um, income, um, relies on this income for like the nursing home and stuff like that, he is less likely to do like organics or things that are gonna be high risk on that land because they really require that income, right? So how much risk can they take on? Um, commitment, does the landowner, is the landowner committed to it, right? If, <laughs> if I were to go to my landowner right now, um, you know, he's on board for the most part, but I would want him to be fully committed because it is his land, he is getting a rent payment from me and everything, and he needs to be in it as well. If you're dragging a landowner kicking and screaming at the first time of trouble, they're going to bolt, right? They're not going to like it. So you need to have a commitment from them. Feasibility. The acres they own, are they conducive to the conservation practices that you are suggesting? You know, is it well drained? Is the climate well suited for the practices? Um, are there other farmers who are successful at doing these practices um, in the area? So um, this came up when I was talking to someone because I have a, 
a friend who works in DeKalb County, which is right kind of, it's north of us, um, closer to Chicago. And he says, we can't do cover crops in our county, right? They just never work. And so it's telling that to one of the farm managers, he goes, that's not true. You just have to choose the right cover crop, right? What works in Southern Illinois is not gonna work in Northern Illinois. What works in Northern Illinois may not work in Minnesota and Wisconsin and everything. So you really need to know uh, that you're not forcing the issue of something, that you're doing something that works within the environment and on the land. Um, also control. Uh, is the landowner willing to operate in a shared decision-making process? And does the landowner want to make all the decisions or are they okay with the farmer? I often have people ask me, I'm, you know, what do you look for in a tenant? Um, and I say, you look for someone you can trust and that do, does their job very well, and then you let them do their job, right? They're going to know that land really well. We don't own all the land we farm, but I, my uncle and my dad, who have farmed it for 40, 50 years, they can tell you where every wet spot is. They can tell you everything about those farms. The farmer knows the land better than a lot of landowners, especially landowners who have never stepped foot on their farms, which is becoming more and more common. Um, financial. So I, I asked Marcel when I was doing this presentation, because everybody brings up organics when we talk about these practices. And I, I just want to say, you know, I, I do recognize that organics is, there's a lot of tillage and some people may be against tillage and everything, but I am going to loop organics in here because it does involve cover crops. And in some way it is a good way to get people involved in, in such things, other than just going into the normal conventional corn and soybean rotation. If you're in a transition year for organics, are you able to maybe take a little less of a cash rent payment since the farmer isn't making as much? Are you able to uh, financially be able to afford to do that with your farmer a little bit? Or maybe you reduce their cash rent payments for the first couple of years and then they pay it back to you when, you know, when they have that organic corn in that third year of harvest, basically. So that's kind of the things that if you were talking to a farmer or a farmer wants to talk to their landowner, you have to have these things in the back of your mind and these issues need to be addressed, right? You, it's, you need to be aware of who that landowner is. They're the ones that have to make the decision at the end of the day. And I would say that this is the first slide, this is almost the most important slide because at the end of the day, the landowner gets to decide. If the landowner wants to do those practices, they get to do those practices and they will find a farmer that will do it for them if their current tenant will not. Um, let's see. Okay, tenant considerations. Uh, risk level, what is the tolerance um, to risk level for financial reward? I'm going to give this example because we have seen this a lot. Um, like I said, we work a lot with organics and it's a lot of row crop organics and when you are new to organics, it is a new way of farming. And if you do it slowly over time, small changes mean small mistakes. It's the same with cover crops. I'm not going to go out there to my fields and put cereal rye on everything because if there's a mistake, it's going to happen on everything. So the risk level on it, right? Can you mitigate lift, risk on it? Is there something that they're going to get out of it? You know, so when we hear that farmers are talking to their lenders and their lenders say, oh, if you're just going to do organic, rip the Band-Aid off and transition all at once, we cringe because we have seen what those uh, those income statements and P&Ls look like when they transition all at once. And it's not pretty, especially if you've never done it before, right? So can the farmer take on the risk? Um, the other part of this too is, when it comes to conservation practices, it's not going to be as simple as, oh, you're going to get organic prices. So when my dad and I are discussing cover crops, which we're discussing it more than ever before, the conversation goes more into how much can we save on fertilizer? How much will it build up the soil um, for the future, right? We are not expecting to see financially really any benefit for it from it from, for a few years. We know that, right? We're going to be putting in this extra work and putting in this extra, um, something I, not as easy as just, you know, putting on dry fertilizer and everything. And we know that um, it's going to, we're probably going to lose a little bit of money at the very beginning of it, right? So that is a discussion we have and tenants need to decide that too. Are they able to financially do this? Commitment. 
Um, this goes this goes a long way. I'm going to give this example. Um, we had a family member, they're conventional farmers, and their landowner wanted to go to organics. And if they weren't going to do it, they were going to find somebody to do it. So they said, we'll do it, we'll do it, because they just want to keep the acres. They figured out real quick that their heart was not in it. It was really hard for them to get a good yield. They didn't have the time to go out there and do the weed management. They didn't really have time to go out there and do the cover crops or anything like that. The off years weren't really good for them. When I mean off years, not corn or soybeans, something the big money makers. Um, you know, it's just not something they were interested in. We say in our area, and I realize I'm talking about organics a lot, but in our area, if you you can tell a bad organic farmer, but you can't tell who has a who's a good organic farmer because their fields look like everybody else's. Bad organic organic farmers just think they're going to go out there and just you know, farm it and be done with it. It's kind of the same with conservation practices. If you have something where you're not supposed to do anything with the land, yeah, it's pretty easy, right? You put it in CRP or something where you're not supposed to touch it, that's easy. But if you have something like um, something that can get away from you that can affect your yields and everything, and if you're not on top of it, it can really be messy. I have a farmer that did some hairy vetch. Um, and when they went to plant this spring, it was not pretty. It was literally, even though it was so dry in our area, it was like planting on mud because it was just, their tires would just spin on the hairy vetch. And so they ended up having to change what crop they planted because they just couldn't get it to work, right? It did that, the crop they were going to plant was not going to work. So, you know, they had a commitment to it. And I asked them, are you going to try hairy vetch again? And they're like, yes, but we're going to learn from our mistakes, right? They didn't just cut and run. So your tenant needs to have a commitment to it. Um, cause it's going to take, it might take some trial and error on it. Resources. This is kind of a big deal. So, and I'm going to keep using, I'll use myself as an example, as much as, you know, if you guys will let me, this was a conversation we had as far as like, if we were going to put cover crops in up until this last spring, because we did not have guidance in our planter tractor. I always said my uncle Eddie was our GPS cause he just planted really straight. We did not have the ability to uh, comfortably plant into something like cereal rye and see our marker on the planter. And that made us really nervous. Since we have that guidance in that tractor now, that conversation has changed a little bit. So when you're looking for a tenant or you're talking to a farmer about these conservation practices, you need to be able to say, do they have the time to do it? Do they have the knowledge to do it? Do you maybe need to um, recommend some classes with them. Maybe they need to look up, you know, what's involved with it. Is there another farmer that could mentor them? Mentorship in this sort of thing is a really good idea um, because you can learn from other mistakes in the area so you don't repeat them, right? Um, does the farmer have livestock for grazing, do manure for fertilizer? Like, what do they have, okay? Um, I just mentioned the experience. Experience with conservation practices is good. And in fact, um, I have the, the friends that I have that do conservation practices, whether it's cover crops or CRP, I am constantly picking their brains. And I have been out in the tractor with them when they have been in the field working some of this ground or you know, planting some of it or planting into it just to kind of see what's involved, right? So does the farmer have experience? And if they don't have experience, do they have a mentor lined up that can help them, you know? Um, Long-term lease. So like I said, it's going to be a trial and error. Some things are going to work. Some things are not going to work. If they have a long-term lease, you're going to give that, the landowner is going to give them freedom to kind of try things. They're not going to try things out of the realm of possibility for their area and the climate and the soil, but it gives them an ability and a freedom to not have that hanging over their head that if something doesn't work, they don't have time to fix it, right? Um, also transparency. You need to be honest, the land, the tenant needs to be honest with the landowner about the results, right? Soil testing is a very good way to do that. Sharing those soil tests, if it's a farm manager uh, that you're working through for the, on behalf of the landowner, share those soil test results. Because I guarantee you those farm managers probably have other customers or other clients doing the same thing. And they may be like, well, you're a little short on nitrogen. Why don't you try this? This worked here. You know, see, and they're going to know these things, right? So the more transparent a tenant is with a landowner, the better it is for everybody involved. And if I, you know, as a, if I was a landowner and, you know, someday I, maybe I'll be, I don't know, but like, I would want my tenant to be honest with me. If there's an issue, I want to know about it, right? So 
having a tenant that's honest with you, isn't trying to hide things from you is very important. Um, so if you are a farmer and you want to do these practices, you got to be ready to explain why either to your landowner directly or to the farm manager, you need to say why, what, how does this benefit the landowner? If your landowner is out there just to cash a check and as a tenant, you're out there for the environmental concerns, it may not jive. You may have to somehow take your message and put it in terms that they can understand. You may have to show them money. You know, you have to talk their language. You have to understand what their concerns are and be able to um, reduce some of those concerns. Okay, so land considerations. Uh, we talked about this a little bit. Is the farm conducive to conservation practices and organic practices? Um, we have a landlord. Um, he had, we farm one farm, a friend of ours farms the other, they do it organic, but the farm that we farm is a wet hole. It would not do very well with organic. And the farm manager knows that. Don't try to force the issue on something, right? Find something that works. If, if the tenant or the landowner wants to do conservation practices, find something that works for that farm. If it's a wet farm near a river, could flood, find something that works there, okay? Um, uh, is there tile in it? You know, it just kind of depends. Like don't, you can't force land to do something that it's not meant to do, right? Um, that goes to the current state of the ground, right? You need to know where you're starting. Like, how do you know what you need to plant if you're going to do something like cover crops if you don't know what the land needs? Um, one of the organic farmers we work with talks about a soil bank, right? He says your, your soil is like having money in a bank. You have money in certain accounts, right? Your 401k does this. Your checking account does this. It's the same for your soil. Your nitrogen does this. Your um, potassium does this. It does different things. You need to know where you start, and then you need to be constantly checking that so you know that you're doing the right things for it and what you are doing is working. Um, I just talked about drainage a little bit. If there's drainage issues, that needs to be taken into consideration. Um, and also weeds. There is a gentleman out of Wisconsin, and I or not Wisconsin, Michigan. I wish I could remember his name, but he literally, there's this book and it's, I think it's called like what weeds, when weeds talk or something like that. And it's got this huge chart that literally says, if you have this weed, this is what's wrong with your soil, or this is what your soil is telling you. It's got too much of this or not enough of this, right? Your weeds tell a story. Anything that grows into that field is telling you something. Something is allowing it to grow. So pay attention to weeds. Weeds are gonna tell you the story. And even though most of us as farmers don't like them, you know, they do, they do help. Um, okay. All right, so this kind of goes into um, the attorney who put this together before, but I kind of want to talk about these leases a little bit so you can kind of understand what they look like. The first is a cash rent one. Um, I'm not going to go word for word for this. This is becoming more common as you have more absentee landowners and you have um, more people, probably my generation and younger, who did not grow up on the farm who have maybe never stepped foot on that field in their life and never will. They just take a check. This guarantees them money every time. In my area, in central Illinois, where it's really, really good farm ground, the leases are getting crazy to the point where I don't know how farmers are making money on it. There's some leases I've heard of being $600 an acre. That's not normal. I would say that's the high end. And I, again, as a, as a lender, I don't know how they're making money on those. Um, but the lease, the rent on the lease needs to make it so the, the landowner benefits from it, but also the farmer benefits from it. Um, this also means the landlord does not really want to be involved in the operation of the farm itself. They want nothing to do with it. They just want to get their check. So when it comes to cover crops, they may not care if you do it at all. As long as they get their money, they're going to be happy, right? So, um, so that's on... Um, that's that. Okay, so here's some of the issues. Um, like I mentioned, really high cash rent on this. As from a landowner perspective, if you were going to do a, if someone came to you and said, "I'm going to give you $500 per acre in our area," I'm going to immediately say, "In tight years, how are they going to cash flow that?" Well, they're probably going to skimp on something. It'll probably be fertilizer. I've literally seen leases drawn up where it's a flat cash rent but the landowner pays for the fertilizer and the farmer has to reimburse the, the landowner. And the reason they do that is because they know that farmer is probably gonna skimp on that. They're probably not gonna put as much on there to save money somewhere, right? 
So that kind of needs to be taken into consideration. We have a lease where we have to do soil tests every other year, and we have to put a certain amount of fertilizer on there every year, no matter what. So that's something that can be written into leases. Even flat cash rent leases, you can put that into. Um, at times, if you're worried, if, if a farmer is short on money, the first person they're going to pay is their landowner. Then they're going to pay their vendors, and the last person they're going to pay is the bank. So I'm usually the last, um, simply because we'll, we'll maybe throw them a lifeline, but they're going to need those vendors to put a crop in next year. They're going to need the land to do, be able to have a crop, everything else. So, but if a landlord is concerned about it, they could take a security interest in the crops to ensure payment of the rent. And that has happened essentially, right? Um, they could even have it where they put their name on the crop insurance. So they their name is on the crop insurance as well. So the farmer cannot deposit or cash that check unless the landowner also signs off on it. Um, so that's a cash rent one. Again, that's becoming more and more common. Uh, crop share. Okay, so this is what I like to, I call these 50-50 leases. A lot of times it's 60-40 or 70-30. This is the most fair of the crop, of the uh, leases, because it means the landlord shares in half the cost and the farmer shares in half the cost. And um, the farmer pays for like the fuel and oil and has wear and tear and equipment. The landlord pays for the property taxes, all that stuff. But when the, when the markets are good, they're good for everybody. When they're bad, they're bad for everybody. If the farmer makes money, so does the landowner and vice versa. Um, I have seen, and we actually have one lease that just went to this, where some farmers, they don't want to be involved in marketing, they don't want to be involved in um, the decision making part of it, but they want to have a 50-50 lease, so they will, we are doing, and other farmers are going to this as well, a 50-50 on the net profit on their farms. So that is also another variable in that, they just don't want to be involved in the decision making, but they also, they know it's fair to do a 50-50 lease on that, so. Um, this is where farm managers come in a lot, especially with absentee landowners, right? Because there are decisions that are being made when to market grain, when to, you know, who, what kind of crops to plant, what rotation. If you are talking to a landowner or a tenant or a farm manager about conservation practices, this is a good way to do it. 50-50 lease is a good way to do it, especially if you're asked, if a landowner is asking a tenant, to go into something like organics or do cover crops where there's risk involved. Because as a landowner, you're showing that tenant that you also are sharing in the, the successes and the failures. So if you have a landowner that's like, I don't understand why my tenant won't do this, everything, if they've got a cash rent lease, suggest maybe going to a 50-50 or a 70-30, something that shows that farmer they've got skin in the game as well, right? Um, so this could be a really good tool. Uh, let's see. Um, because the landowner is more involved, a working relationship has to be set up. We have a really good relationship with our land our landlords, and we also have a really good relationship with the farm managers that mar manage it for them. It's very important that that line of communication is is there, right? Um, you also have to be very clear as far as the landowner what you expect from the farmer if you want cover crops or CRP or anything like that. Um, yeah, there are times where you're going to have to share your crop insurance as well. So that all kind of goes into these different lease issues. There's no really one size fits all, but in general, the 50-50 leases and the cash rent leases are probably the most common ones I've seen. Um, there's these hybrid leases, but I kind of want to, and rather than hybrid, I want to talk about what a flex lease is exactly. A flex lease is basically you have a cash rent, um, a base cash rent, and then in the good years, there's a calculation that goes into it that, you know, if you make enough money on that farm, then the landlord gets an additional cash rent payment on it. And it's called flex lease because in bad years, you just get the base rent if you're a landowner. But in good years, you get a bonus, right? Um, so flex leases are really common as well. That's also a fair way of doing it if you're going to do um, cash rent on that. I would also encourage that if you have, if you're a farmer yourself or you have someone who is a farmer in good years, it is always a good idea to share some of those um, profits with your um, landowners, especially if the cash rent could be higher. 
Because if you pay them well in the good years, when it's the bad years, they're not going to come knocking at your door, raising your cash rent. So I'm going to, even if it's not in your lease, you can always give that landowner a bonus. And we do it on our farm and I would encourage you to do it as well because in the bad years are going to be there with you. They're less likely to raise the rent on you. And you also want to show them that you appreciate I was successful using your ground. I want to, I want you to share in the success. So I just kind of want to put that out there. And that's a good way to get a lot of goodwill with your landowners and farm managers if it's just a straight cash rent. Okay. So let's talk, these are some of the tips that the um, landowners had or the farm managers had as far as um, uh, leases. So who pays? If a landowner wants cover crops, then they should expect to reimburse for the cover crops and or the actual costs, right? So maybe they have to reimburse the farmer for their time doing it, maybe a little bit of fuel and oil. Um, if the tenant wants to do it, then it's the tenant's expense, right? So who pays basically decides on who wants to do it. If they both want to do it, maybe they share the cost. Length of the lease. You're not going to fix soil health in one year. So if there are conservation practices or you're, you're transitioning to organic, you need to have more than a one or two year lease. Most of them have said four to five year leases, honestly. If you're transitioning with organic, that basically means you have the two years in which you don't make as much uh, due to the transition. And then that also gives them like two years of a corn and soybean crop to make up that money, plus then make some money on it. So um, if you have a longer lease, that also shows to your tenant that you are committed with them as well. This is a good way for landowners to show commitment is you are locking them in for four or five years. Um, again, Types of lease, like I said before, if you're wanting some of these conservation practices, maybe you go 50-50. You're sharing in the successes, but you're also sharing in the, in the failures, but it's showing your tenant, if you're a landowner, you're showing your tenant that you're in it as well. Um, language. The language needs to be very clear on what needs to be done, right? And if there's a crop share, there's no reason to, for it not to be done because the, the, farm, or the landowner is sharing in that cost with you. Like I mentioned before, if you have a flat cash rent and you're worried about the soil fertility of that farm, then I highly recommend you put it in the lease that they have to have fertilizer, X amount of fertilizer on it every year, or they have to do cover crops. If you're concerned about the environmental impact, then you, that needs to be in the lease, right? So that's something, if you want them to do no-till, that needs to be in the lease. So the better and more clear the language is, the more, oh, what do I want to say here? The more clear the language is, the better the instruction is to the tenant as far as what a landowner wants. And the same goes for the tenant. The more clear you're being with your landowner about what you're doing, the less the landowner is going to feel out of the loop in it. And, and so communication is kind of key and the language and lease, have the lawyer draw it up or a farm manager and make it very clear about what each side needs and wants. CRP. So all the farm managers I talked to, they all talked about CRP. They also talked about buzzwords. Organics is a buzzword. Cover crops is a buzzword. Uh, CRP, they said their, their landowner clients love CRP. In most cases, the landowner gets all the payment. Um, if there's an eligibility issue, one of, the, one of the farm managers said they have the farmers be a pass-through, basically. So the farmer gets the CRP. They get the money paid to them. They qualify for it. They get the money to them, then the farmer pays that payment to the landowner and gives a 1099 to the landowner, right? So basically, they're they're kind of just an intermediary on that. The other thing that was recommended um, by one of them is if you have a farmer doing like the CRP or helping with that or a farm manager, you have someone that is familiar with the USDA. If these landowners, you know, we have landowners in California, Alaska, Florida, we have them all over. If one of our landowners wanted to do these practices, them talking to a to the USDA about these practices is not going to be very practical because they're not going to one, they're not going to know how to talk to them, what they need, or any of that. Farm managers and tenants can bridge the gap. So make sure if there is a landowner that wants to do um, conservation practices that you find a tenant that has got a good relationship with the USDA because that's going to help them with some of these programs, whether it be equip or anything like that. Um, we already talked about this. You need to know the quality of the farm. 
I highly recommend, and if I ever have to run out any ground, I have someday, I will have it in there. There will be soil tests and I will want them at a certain level, right? Because like I said, a lot of these farmers that have these high cash rents are going in there. They're working ground in the fall, working ground in the spring, planting, spraying, harvesting, repeat. They don't do anything as far as cover crops or no-till or anything that can slow them down, okay? And something as simple as no-till, it doesn't really require all that much. I mean, we do no-till, we do no-till without the, the guidance, you know? So something simple like that's pretty good, but it takes longer. You have to wait for it to dry out. And then also it takes longer for it to kind of emerge if it's beans. So um, changes, if you have a change to the lease, uh, if you wanna change a lease or you wanna do these conservation practices, all of them said this to me, the best time to do it is when the current tenant retires. Most of these landowners and tenants have a long-term relationship. They've known each other for decades. The older generation of farmers is not as into cover crops, no-till, organics, or anything like that. The younger generation is. The excitement among the younger generation of farmers to do that, it's high, and they're more likely to adapt practices such as that, right? I mean, our farm is a pretty good example. Uh, my dad is open to organics. My uncle told me it's never going to happen while I'm alive on this earth. So it just kind of depends, right? I'm more open to it. Dad's open to it. My uncle is not. They all, we do no-till. They're open to that. Cover crops, I'm on the edge. I think we might try some here in the next few years. But again, had I not come home, they never would even discuss it. When I came home from Chicago six, seven years ago, you didn't talk to either one of them about cover crops. It was a no-go. And now I have dad talking to me about a strip till bar. Should we get a strip till bar? Should we do this? You know, like all these different things. And he's going to cover crop meetings with me and everything. So it takes time. And as a, if you're working with a farmer who has to talk to a tenant, it takes time. Okay. You have to show them your passion about it and take them to some of these meetings to talk to other farmers because maybe they'll see how it works and maybe they'll be more on board with it. Okay, so these are the farm managers that I talked to. They're all in Illinois, but like I know Rob's got people up in Wisconsin and Minnesota. I think Rick and Russ probably do as well. And Haley uh, works for Moore and Warner doing their conservation and organic um, business. So basically she does all the leases for those, those farmers. That is her part-time gig now. Full-time she works for the company that Bill Gates uh, owns. But Haley is incredibly knowledgeable about this stuff as well. So I always pick her brain on that stuff. There's my information if you have any questions. The other thing I want to mention is we have an organic newsletter and we have had all of these people write articles for us. So I can share that website as well as which um, newsletters had articles from these people in it if you want to read their full articles. Um, because organics and conservation, it can be a, kind of the same um, conversation. Anything past this, and Anna, I hope you're sharing these presentations with them. Anything past this is the legal stuff that um, uh, the lawyer that originally was supposed to do this did. And it gets into the weeds of, you know, handshake agreements, fences, all that stuff. This is, at the very least, if I was going to, you know, when I talk to my family about conservation practices, or if I have a customer that wants to talk to um, their landlord about it, these are some of the things I would like them to think about. I would like them to address some of these things before they go talk to landlord and vice versa. I've had landowners that I'm like, these are the things you need to talk to your tenant about before you even, you know, move on with it. Like you need to figure out what's where you're at. So that was a lot. I hope I didn't rush through that. <laughs> um, again, I'll answer whatever questions best I can. And if I cannot, I will help you find someone who can answer them. So are there any questions? We haven't had any questions in the chat. People have been dropping off as they need to. Um, okay. But feel free to write a question in the chat and we can keep trying to answer them. I, was, I mean, if there's no question, I mean, that I, I have a there question. There is one now. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> what For the landowners who are worried about being considered actively engaged in farming, do they need just one crop share lease with a grower or would they need all of their land to be crop share lease? So I guess, could you kind of do it both ways as a landowner, have some where you're crop worried about them? being considered actually, do they need just one? No, you can have different leases on each field. You, If you owned a thousand acres and each field is a hundred acres, you could have 10 different leases. You could have 10 different farmers doing it. 
And I'm, in fact, we've got one landowner. He's, I think they've got, it's a family. It's quite a bit of ground. I think we're one of four farmers that farm for them. And I, it's not guaranteed that all the leases are the same. So if you have a landowner that, you know, kind of like I mentioned, we, I have that shared landowner with a friend of ours who's doing organic. They're more qualified to do organic than we are. We're farming the conventional ground. I mean, there's two different right. tenants. Who's, who, who is best to do what you need them to do, right? right? If you have a farmer that, you know, wants to do no-till and on some of their ground, but not all of it, and you have a tenant that's absolutely, I'm not doing that. I'm not going in there and doing that then find a farmer who does, but you can still keep that other tenant. You know, you can still have two different farmers and everything. So you can absolutely, like I said, you have a thousand acres and you could have a different lease for every single farm, different right. terms. That's okay. a very good question. Yeah. And you can see how that would develop with these relationships that you might have different arrangements with different people. Right. Um, I just want to remind everybody, this is the first time we've run these trainings. So thank you for bearing with us as we deal with technical difficulties and present this stuff for the first time, we will be sending out an evaluation afterward and look forward to hearing your feedback or feel free to email any one of us. Uh, I think we will wrap up there, but we'll see you again on Thursday at 10 o'clock unless anyone else has any concluding comments. Okay, thank you, Sarah and Paul. Really appreciated both your presentations. I learned a lot. I'm on this conservation side, learning about the finance side. I appreciate your time. Thank you guys, appreciate it.